So you've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, but how do you know which kind of MS? I mean, how do you tell the difference between relapsing forms of MS and primary progressive MS? And how certain is your neurologist? My name is Aaron Boster. I'm an MS neurologist in Columbus, Ohio. And in this video, I'm going to be answering that exact question. How do you tell the difference between relapsing forms of MS and primary progressive MS? Don't turn away because all of that starts right now. Hey! Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. In today's video, I want to tackle a frequently asked question. How do I know that someone has primary progressive MS as compared to relapsing MS? It's often that someone will come to see me in consultation and they've been given an MS diagnosis, but they're not exactly clear on which kind they have. Maybe the neurologist went as far as to tell them you have blankety blank, but they aren't always clear on how they came up with that. So in this video, I would like to share with you how a neurologist thinks through this is PPMS compared to this is relapsing MS. When you're making an MS diagnosis, any MS diagnosis, there's five elements to that. The first one is the story. Now we call that the clinical history because it's all highfalutin sounding, but it's essentially what you tell me. It's what brought you to my attention. And I like to talk through the story that I expect to hear in the setting of relapsing multiple sclerosis as compared to the story that I expect to hear with primary progressive MS. Grab a pen and paper and let's jump in. When I'm taking a neurological history for MS, I'm listening for an MS attack, a flare, an exacerbation, a relapse. It's all the same thing. And what I'm listening for is the onset of the deficit, how long it took to come on, how long it lasted, and then whether or not it got any better. Different neurological conditions have different onset. So on one extreme, if you have a vascular event, like a stroke, God forbid, you suddenly cut off blood supply to a part of the brain, that part of the brain immediately dies because it doesn't have any blood, and you suddenly lose a function, so like half your face droops. And that's a vascular event. So we associate the fast, sudden onset with blood vessel type stuff. On the other extreme, a cancer is oftentimes rather slow growing, and you may develop a deficit over literally months and months. And that is not what we're listening for in the setting of an attack. In the setting of an attack, we're listening for an onset that is called subacute, meaning the event initiated and kind of ramped up over a period of hours, oftentimes days. So that subacute onset is what we expect to hear when there's inflammation afoot. See, the reason that someone with MS has an attack is the naughty autoreactive immune system, which is in the bloodstream, crosses the blood-brain barrier, gains access to the central compartment, and sees the supercomputer, the brain, or the superhighway, the spinal cord, but thinks it's looking at a bad guy and attacks it using inflammation. Inflammation causes that area to short circuit but it doesn't do it suddenly like a stroke, and it doesn't do it slowly, chronically like in a tumor. It does it over a couple days. I teach my patients that if you wake up and your hand's numb and you shake it out and it feels better, you don't have to call me. If you wake up and your hand's numb and then the next day it's more numb, now I want a phone call because that is tripping what I call the 24-hour rule. New MS attacks will last longer than 24 hours and oftentimes the ramp up is subacute. Think about this. If you got sassy with me and punched me in my cheek and my face got all puffy, tomorrow it's more puffy. Why? Because it's inflamed and that inflammation doesn't go away in a couple of minutes and it's not gonna last just an hour, it's gonna go on for a while. So when we are listening to someone describing a neurological deficit, we're trying to see if the story fits with the subacute onset, the thing that we would expect to hear in the setting of an MS attack. Likewise, with an MS attack, particularly early on in the disease, we listen for some form of recovery. The person may have deficits for weeks or even months, and then there may be uh, improvement. Sometimes early on, that improvement is 100% all the way back to normal. Sometimes it's not all the way back to normal, it's only a partial recovery. But again, as we think about an attack, ideally we would like to hear a story where it kind of came on, was like that for a while, and then had some degree of improvement. 
and that clinical history is going to sensitize the neurologist that they're probably dealing with a relapsing form of multiple sclerosis. Now, when I describe an attack to someone who's experienced PPMS, they look at me like I'm an alien. They have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about because that has not been their experience. The story that we're listening for in primary progressive MS is quite different. It's a insidious onset, at least over a period of one year, and oftentimes involves aspects of the spinal cord. So the PPMS example would sound maybe something like this. Doc, I used to golf twice a week and I was pretty darn good. I golf once with my buddies in a competitive league and then once with my wife for fun. And about five years ago, my friends somewhat semi-politely asked me to stop competing with them because I, I wasn't able to keep up. And so, so is life. I just started to golf with my wife more. But about two years ago, I really struggled to finish the 18 holes and so we started to cut back and just do, say, nine holes. And last year, I really didn't golf very much. This year, I don't have a golf membership. And I've found that if I grab my dad's old cane, it helps me a little bit when walking to the car. Now, that story is hard to put your thumb on exactly where it started. It does not involve a subacute onset like we talked about with relapsing MS. On the other hand, what we're hearing is a slow, steady decline in function over a long period of time. That's the kind of progression that we're listening for in someone who has primary progressive MS. Is it impossible for someone with PPMS to have a relapse? No, it's not impossible, but it is not what we're listening for at the time of diagnosis. If the human being expresses that they've had an attack, that's gonna be a relapsing form of multiple sclerosis. We're in the PPMS story, we're listening for that slow, steady decline in function where there isn't a clear cut onset. The second element in working up an MS diagnosis is what we do on the neurological examination, or sometimes I joke, the MS Olympics. And the neurological examination is intended to help support what the person told us. So if the person told us that they were unsteady on their feet, and then we examine them and see that they're unsteady on their feet, it supports what they told us. This does not really get us closer to clarifying whether it's a relapsing form of MS or a primary progressive form of MS. Now, a seasoned MS neurologist will have some ideas in mind about things they see more commonly with PPMS than with relapsing MS. For example, with PPMS, we, see, we might see more of a myelopathic picture, meaning more spinal cord involvement, bowel, bladder, bedroom, legs, stuff like that, where that's not necessarily the case with relapsing MS, but that is not gospel. And I would submit to you that the exam by itself is not going to clarify one phenotype from the other. You've made it this far into the video. Thank you. Do me a kind favor and give the video a thumbs up. It helps teach the YouTube algorithm that you dig this content and helps push it out so more people impacted by MS can benefit. Thank you. The third element to the diagnostic criteria is the MRI. And in the ancient days of yesteryear, we literally would have different MRI criteria to diagnose relapsing forms of MS compared to primary progressive forms of MS. The key difference is with PPMS, we really expected to see spinal cord involvement, at least two lesions on the spinal cord. With relapsing MS, you may or may not have that. And in both phenotypes, we expect to see brain lesions. Now, the diagnostic criteria for MS are constantly evolving. And I think what we'll see very soon is that we're not going to make big differentiations based just on the MRI. I don't think that exclusively based on the imaging that we could sort them out. The fourth element to the diagnosis, as I mentioned earlier, is spinal fluid. And in the past, we included spinal fluid as a criteria to confirm a PPMS diagnosis. And as I make this video in 2024, many primary progressive clinical trials demand positive spinal fluid to be assured that the person really does have PPMS. That stated, it is not required that you have uh, abnormal spinal fluid for either PPMS or relapsing MS. And I wouldn't submit that you can make the differentiation exclusively based on the spinal fluid. Real quick before we go on, if you've subscribed to the channel, thank you very much. And if you have yet to subscribe, please consider doing so. Just click that little button. Thank you. So in summary, of the five elements to help us really sort out, is this phenotype more relapsing 
or primary progressive, it is heavily, heavily weighted based on your story. Your story is going to have more to do with how we differentiate that than the exam findings, than the MRI findings, than the spinal fluid findings, or the other differential diagnosis workup that we do. When I am helping trying to figure out what's wrong with you, I have to ask good questions and then I have to shut up and listen and let you give me the information. I'm a firm believer that you're a you expert and that if I can listen carefully, you'll probably tell me the answers, including which kind of MS you have. If you'd like to up your game and learn more about MS, click the video that's on your screen right now. And until my next Monday morning video or my next monthly live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.